All right, welcome to today's episode of Is It Prophecy here on Israel National Radio, Arut Sheva, and the show is syndicated as Messiah Hour on YouTube. You can go to YouTube and type in Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is free to do so. Any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email me at messiahhour at gmail.com. This show is dedicated to Mikhail Ruth, a friend of mine who passed away on Tumishvat, and I attended her funeral earlier in the day. The show is being recorded Wednesday night and airing Thursday. And obviously, when a person passes away, there's a lot of questions regarding what happens to them as far as a Jewish spiritual perspective. And... Where are the sources for that in Judaism? So on the line to discuss this on very short notice, we really appreciate it. Good friend of the program comes on weekly. Rabbi David Katz of SoulBazal.com. Rabbi, how are you doing out there? Hi, Ari. Thanks for having me back on. Looking forward to this. Yeah, so let's first talk about the question regarding the afterlife. I find it very interesting that while Christianity's main focus is the afterlife, meaning you have to believe in Jesus to go there, to the good part, etc. If you don't, you go to the bad part. Islam is very much into the whole 72 versions thing, etc. And Judaism doesn't talk about Olam Haba or, or afterlife, whatever you want to call it, that much. It's a small percentage of our dialogue. I want to know why is that? There's a, there's a very simple reason. Um, when you go to yeshiva and learn Torah, you know, even let's say your first day, they, the, rabbi, the rabbi's view and the Torah view is is to get you into Olam Hazeh, this world. You know, the whole Jewish function is we live for this world and not the world to come. And you'll say, but didn't we always say the opposite, Rabbi Katz? That don't we live for the world to come and this world just a, a, a pass by through? So the answer is like this. We, we are all about Olam Haba and the nation's, the, idol, the idolatrous aspect is about Olam Hazet, right? This world versus the world to come. The Jew says, you know, we're going to kind of forsake the pleasures of this world for the divine quality of what is to come based on merit and righteousness. And the idolatrous approach is, um, you know, my God will just save me, and therefore I get to experience every delight in this world, which we know becomes a perversion. But then again, once you have that perspective, then it's, it's switched, right? They are really only living for the world to come. They think, um, right, they're kind of foregoing any opportunity of God in this world, and therefore they think that, you know, their heaven will be some kind of uh, fantasy land. And our, our world, this world, becomes the divine opportunity to do mitzvot and to work, you know, on a relationship with God. So effectively, even though you have faith that you're going to get the world to come in Judaism, you really are all about this world. You know, they say, you know, one minute of Olam Haba um, is more than all of this world, but this one minute of this world is worth more than all of Olam Haba. So where you go when you die, as long as you're faithful, righteous, and good, you just kind of believe you're going to go to a good place. But the, the paramount responsibility, as we saw even in Moses, is you strive for the ultimate perfection of, of this world, of repair, relationship with God. Ultimately, you're trying to force God's hand into giving you the world to come in this world. It's, it's a fantastic idea, but that's what it's about, doing mitzvot in this world. So the again, just to kind of bring this to a full conclusion, this idea, you need to learn how to pray and to learn and talk to God. And the last thing on your mind should be the ins and outs of the world to come. Whereas, again, in the idolatrous sect, you want to know, you know, forget this world. I'm, I'm already knowing I'm going to have a good time here. Tell me how much better it'll be in the world to come. So I get a great world here of fooling around. I want to hear how much it's going to be like Disneyland in the next world. Whereas Judaism, you know, it, it takes the reverence of this world and, you know, it's like saving the best part for last. If you make it to understand the world to come, I mean, that means you accomplished everything. Now, there are not that many books written about this topic, but there are some. We're going to delve into one of those books now. Can you tell our audience a bit about this work we're going to talk about? 
Yeah, there's a, I have this book, and I may be the only guy on the planet that has it. Um, a, he has two books, and that's how I found it. I was in the used bookstore in Spot a couple of years ago. And, you know, my work, as you know, is uh, is Mazel, right? SoulMazel.com. Um, hey, SoulMazel. Right? There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I teach Mazel, which everyone will say, but wait a minute. We don't have mazel. We're Jews, and we don't believe in mazel, which sounds very much like what you're saying now. Hey, don't we do we do we believe in the world to come? Or you know, so we know the nations do. The nations believe in mazel. The bottom line is we do believe in mazel. But you know, to back up one second again, I was in the used bookstore, and I saw a book called the Encyclopedia of Mazel in Hebrew. Um, that's a generic name. It's really called Otsar Hamazel, the Treasury of Mazel. And I thought, hey, that's a pretty good mazel if I'm finding that book. And I got it, and it really is the greatest book on this planet. Because it's an author by the name of Rav Yitzchak Cholmish. He's kind of like a, a Dati Lumi Rav, but what he's done, he's brilliant. He has a fascination for these kind of things. And he combed the Kabbalah and Oral Torah, rabbinic writings, literally exhausting, and put together the immaculate treasury of everything ever spoken about kosher mazel sources. And his approbations, he has like 30 of like every huge rabbi of the generation. So he's more than kosher. And the Kiddush is, the revelation is, is that yes, Jewish people believe in mazel, but you know, of a Jewish flavor. So then I, th- I looked into this guy. I said, who is this guy? I mean, this is my guy. And I t- it turns out it's a rare print. I think he's alive today. But then he had another book. And this is this book here. It's called Echayim Shala Achir Hamavis Olam and Hashemas. Life After Death, The World of Souls. I saw that he had this. I said, I got to get that book. I mean, that is far out. So I did. And I'm embarrassed to say I've not opened it until I, I talked to Ari Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and we cracked it open, you and I, right? And we saw this book is just like the Mazel book. Um, I got it relatively recently, so but it's just like the Mazel book. He went through all of tradition and he composed every authentic rabbinic source of a life after death or world of souls episode whether it was this rabbi in the Talmud, Elijah, and he put together a good composite view of what do Jews believe concerning life after death. And the reason why we don't know about it is because we have better things to do. Now, in my other work, GearGear.com, World of the Gear, on sale now, <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know, my work about Garim, as everyone knows, um, you know, it's like a it's like a hidden idea in the Talmud. It's there, but you have to really comb through to get a perspective. So I think that's why I appreciate this this guy, because I kind of did the same thing with the Ger. So there are things in Jewish spirituality that we have, but to to get to it, you gotta, gotta really search and want it. Whether it be Ger, maybe a Nazarite, you know, um, widows, the Torah, demonology. We have kind of things in Torah, um, but you have to search it out because it's not the top priority. So Mazel, Garim, demons, widows, Nazarites, the Sota waters, red heifers that are burned, right? We have these things, but you got to look for it. And ultimately, life after death, uh, this guy felt the need to do it. And thank God he put together a great piece. And therefore, we can see we have a very rich tradition of where we go and what happens after death. Again, you're listening to Is It Prophecy here on Israel National Radio, Root Sheva, and the show is syndicated as the Messiah Hour on YouTube. Go to YouTube and type in Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Again, speaking with Rabbi Katz of Solmazal.com. Rabbi Katz, let's talk about some of the customs that happen after a person physically passes away, such as the funeral, and there is a hesped, a speech that talks about the person why is that so significant, and what exactly does it do for the person? So we saw in this Sefer, right, Hachayim Shel Achramavis, Life After Death, that the Hespid, uh, is, that, is that an English or Hebrew word? I believe it's a Hebrew word. All right, what, what's the, uh, I forget, what's the English word? Eulogy. 
Yiddish, yes, right. right. I just wanted to forget the English versus the Hebrew. Um, the Hespit is the eulogy, right? And what the book is saying is, is that you know, the, the I haven't really been to too many funerals because I'm a, I'm a Kohen, right? I'm a priest in Judaism, so we're not allowed to go to the cemetery. Right. But I, I went to one because they say in spot you can kind of like stand behind, like outside if it's summertime and not raining or whatever. I don't know how how the rules work because I never I can't go to a cemetery. But I got to go to one once, so I kind of know what I'm talking about just from that one experience. So I'm not the best guy to rely on with grave stories and, and these kind of things. But, again, the Torah forbids a, a Kohen to go into a cemetery. Right. Um, so what I, from what I saw and from what he's talking about, the dead guy is, is in front of the congregation, right? People that are going to come to mourn his, his death. And in Judaism, you're going to probably bury him the same day that he died, or very soon, if not the same day. So he's fresh, and everyone's shocked, right? Because he just died. And they bury, they, they wrap him in a shroud and things. Again, I don't know the semantics because I don't go, um, and I'm never going to go, <clears throat> God willing. So, but the idea is that they're giving a hesped, and the hesped is to is to is to gain rachmim or mercy on the dead guy, because as we're gonna as we're realizing. Uh, I don't want to call him the dead guy for now. Let's call him the mace, right? Right, because, it, you know, it could be male or female, so let's say the mace. Right, the mace. So the, the mace is going through a separation, and his fate is, is being determined as we speak, right? He's going – the mace is going through din, judgment, where he's going to – where they're going to go, what's happening, the degree of separation, all of his fate, if you will, of the, of the judgment. Your job as as the you in the eulogy and those crying and mourning for the mace, mace meaning the dead, is to gain compassion and mercy. So the, this entire interview, you're going to see a symbiotic relationship between the grieving and the dead. The dead's going through his own story of separation and destiny. And the, the, the grieving are really not concerned with the journey of the mace. They're more concerned, you know, why is Billy gone, right? Um, you know, the, whoever there is that died. So they're, it's self-absorbed in, in a very healthy way because the dead is self-absorbed. Um, the ego is what kills a person ultimately. So they're dealing with their ego and you're dealing with your ego because it's really not about you. So why are you crying, right? It's, he, the person has their own journey. It's not about you. But this is the thing. We're human, and this is where God says, get it out of your system, right? Mourn. You're, it's okay to be self-absorbed at that time. Like this is one of the, you know, it's like, uh, you know, relations between man and woman is an act of the evil inclination, technically, right? So the Judaism and Torah, what's unique about Torah is it allows you to engage in, let's say, somewhat illegal activity. Drinking wine, right? Getting drunk. Not drunk, drunk, but, right? but on Kiddush, you're drinking wine which they say was the sin of, the, of Adam and Eve. So the Torah wants to repair certain things. So if the, if the mace died over ego, you're going to lament and mourn through ego, right? Nachash, snake, is the same gematria as Mashiach, 358. The anti-venom is what cures the venom. And I think that's what's going on. So as the separation is happening and whatever fate awaits the mace, the people are mourning and, and doing the eulogy to arouse compassion and mercy to kind of work with the dead in this entire separation and episode that's going on uh, that comp composed, is composed of the dead and the living. Now, let's talk about the experiences of a good person versus the experiences of a bad person after they pass away. What happens? So this is the thing. If you're – I mean, look, I guess we can speak practically, right? If you're a bad guy – you're probably going to get a kind of corny eulogy, right? If you're a thief and a no good, you know, this and that, you know, they're going to, you know, I mean, look, it's reality, you know? You know, nobody liked Bob. So they're like, Bob's great, wasn't he? Yeah, Bob was, Bob was, um, that was Bob. Bob was, um, yeah. 
you know. But no, right, no one <laughs> says at a funeral Bob was bad, but they might not talk right. about <laughs> him for so long in a good right. way. Right, and, you know, and then people say, you know, hey, somebody shows up and says, you know, I know what he did. So, you know, look, you're, you're get, you, you have fate of judgment. You know, if, if if you made a serious enemy the day before you died, that person might show up and say the guy was no good and owe me 25 bucks. But on the flip side, when Avadia Yosef dies, what was like a million people go to the Levaya, right? Right. So, you know, you're going to have the fate of, of, and destiny of, of your day. But the point is also in the separation, you know, if you're, let's say, righteous, your separation will be, they say, like hair being brought out of uh, milk. Whereas if it's a rough separation, it's like pulling cotton out of a thorn. And this, this can be drawn up a million ways. You know, you never know your judgment, but the judgment begins when you start to sense your death. So everybody's unique and, and different, but really the the... The, the spectrum is based on are you good or bad in a very generic sense, and that's going to determine your experience, right? So, you know, if you are in the realm of good, it's going to be more of a good experience. If you're in the realm of bad, it'll be a bad experience. Um, what that looks like is none of my business and none of yours. It's kind of like Job, right? Job, the book of Job, he experienced what he was experiencing and his friends wanted to say, oh, I know why, because you're a horrible person. So the, the idea of Job is it's not your job to judge Job and tell him what his experience is. You don't go to a funeral and say, I knew it. You're a low life. Look at this. Now, no one even came to this guy's funeral. What a low life. Right? You don't have that luxury to do that. You don't have the right to do that. But in the ultimate, you know, God is the true judge. Whatever's going on in truth, that is determined on your uh, success of this world in, a, in an altruistic, objective sense, according to Torah. Okay, let me throw a curveball question here, because let's say someone is righteous, but for whatever reason, they didn't have a lot of friends. Maybe they weren't so social. They were quiet, shy, whatever. So there's not a lot of people at the funeral, and therefore there's not a lot of people saying positive things. Does that still have an effect on the person if they were good and they were righteous and, and all those good things? How many people went to Moses' funeral? Zero, right? That's it. That's and, it. And so <laughs> Moses is doing five shmaim. So so a person could be righteous, not have people at his funeral and or their or her funeral and it won't hurt them. That's right. Everybody's unique. You know, you you could have a billion people at your funeral and still be a sh a shlemiel, You know? It, it, as I'm saying, you cannot judge it. You are not God. This is the one day that God says, I am the judge of this guy. Right? You're not supposed to judge anyways, but all the more so, the day of death, that is when you say, Brooke, die Right. And you are not the one who's the die Emmis here, right? So it's between him and God, really. All right, let's talk about this concept. I had an argument with a friend of mine about this. Of There's stories in the Talmud, and we have traditional stories of people actually going to the afterlife and coming back. Are those stories literal or figurative? Tell us if those really happened. Right, so we, 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 we look through the book, and we see that Judaism has its well, legend, right, but I guess tradition of life after death. We we do have it. And and you're aware of it. You just weren't aware that you were aware of it. Every kid in America knows about Elijah coming to the Seder, right? We all know that from Hebrew school. So we know that there's a concept of this prophet Elijah. He is dead or something, right, in the eyes of a 10-year-old kid, right? And I'm going to put the wine on the table, and Elijah is going to knock on the door and drink the wine, right? We all... We've all heard that. So we're not foreign to the concept of some kind of visitation from the world of souls. And when the book is explaining, or even, even more so, when you, when you go to Yeshiva and learn a Talmud, right, everybody learns the tractate of brachas. It's like the standard tractate to learn in Yeshiva. And in the first, I forget what chapter it is, in the third chapter, uh, even the first chapter, it's a lot of places 
you hear stories about Sadiq Immer. I think in the third chapter, a girl comes back looking for her makeup, if I'm not mistaken. And so you're, you're going you're gonna to run into it in Judaism if you just open your eyes a little bit. So the concept is known to you. Um, and with that said, what, what the book here that we're relying on is, is drawing from is we have a tradition. It's a rich tradition. And the more you look, you'll see there's always been a, a, an example. I mean, look, even the Tanakh, I think um, Saul, King Saul resurrected uh, Samuel from the grave and asked him, like the spirit, right, and said, you know, what's going on? Am I, I forget the details of the story, but Samuel said, what are you doing? Why are you, like, sorcering my soul? Right, so we, it's a, this is a, a verse of the Torah. Right. So, again, it goes back to the ancient times, and the point of the book is it happens in, in modern times. It says that one of the vehicles of, of this kind of connection is that you may get a dream of, the, of a recently passed on family member saying, you know, good luck tomorrow on your test or something. And so there, there's always been these stories. And the point is, is that because it's a consistent model of communication, even like what do you call it, the occult or whatever, right? But because it's current and ancient and all through time, the stories are literal. That, that we have had visitation, um, you know, in dreams, whatever it is, whatever the, the, the bizarre episode is, are some of the cases uh, figurative or allegorical? Al- allegory? Probably. Right? They say every, you know, if you believe every Midrash, you're a moron. And if you... Uh, believe it, not about you a heretic. Right. So, you know, some of them are probably allegorical. And, and, you know, if a big rub says, you know, they, you know, my my father died, came to me in a dream, and he took me to Gan Eden, and then we went to the Antarctica, then we went under the sea, and then I went to a whale. And, okay, that's great. <laughs> but uh, but it looks like the idea and basic premise, and again, this is what we found in our research tonight, as you were with me, that there's a symbiotic relationship all the time between the living and the dead. And, uh, the Vilna Gon talks about it in his commentary of Song of Songs. Whether it's I mean, look, it could be dreams and um, helping the soul on the your side through uh, Kaddish. All kinds of communication and, and joint efforts and merit and mazel. So it, it, it's a literal thing, and it, 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 it maybe uh, even manifests in the allegorical. It might not be like a physical thing. It's everything, but there is what to rely on as an, a bona fide principle of this world. All right, quick break. On the other side, we'll have part two of this discussion. This is Is a Prophecy on IsraelNationalRadio.com. 